Um, we give that cancer word a lot of power, right? So we establish that as like, as soon as you hear it, you know, you're kind of instilled with this fear where it already, you kind of already feel powerless. So in the first couple days when I was just trying to wrap my head around everything, I kind of wanted to take some of its power away and give it back to myself. So I started, that's how I kind of coped with it to some extent. I, you know, wrote a letter explaining the situation to like, you know, close friends and family and, you know, defined it as cancer with a K. And CF patients are five to 10 times more likely to develop colon cancer because of our uh, genetic defect caused by cystic fibrosis, but we're still not even screened or recommended that we get screened until age 40. So again, 34, not 40, but that's like why I'm an advocate for lowering the screening age because they are finding colon cancer in younger and younger people. It's actually like a borderline epidemic as reported by numerous reputable news outlets. We have to save ourselves to some extent. Like we have to be our own advocate. Like if we think something's off or feels not right, like follow that instinct and don't take no for an answer, you know, because you could end up saving your own life after that scam. So how is chemotherapy treating you? I don't, in, I don't enjoy it, but it's kind of, I've kind of like made this relationship with it where it's a necessary evil, right? Like it's keeping me alive. The odds of me being here to have this conversation with you when I first got diagnosed probably were not very good, to mm -hmm. be honest. So I'll uh, see you at the club tomorrow night after your IV thing? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, that's... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring mm -hmm. my poison and then you guys can buy your poison. There you the go. So perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to have the same side effects in the morning, you know, nausea, vomiting, all that. Right. So it works out really well. Yeah. Yeah, I lost all my hair in, or most of my hair in October of 2021. I shaved the rest off because it actually hurts when it falls out. Huh, really? Besides being super depressing and upsetting, it hurts. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. I didn't know then. How would I know now if it was, you know, coming back or, or whatever? Like, knock on wood, hopefully it's not doing any of those things. But, you know, so I think waiting for the scan results is, like, super anxiety provoking for sure like they actually call it skin scan anxiety like they take yeah. scan and add anxiety and combine them together we only have one life and we literally have zero idea how long we will be here i was supposed to not be here now aside from cancer like my life expectancy was 17 when i was born in 1987 from cystic fibrosis so you know i to that extent i lived almost 20 years longer than originally expected <laughs> so i actually told my doctor that like not long after i got diagnosed when i found out wrestlemania was coming to philly i was like hey buddy we gotta do our best <laughs> to keep me alive at least until wrestlemania of 2024 he was like what i was like since we're all on the wrestling topic let's talk about your dwayne the rock johnson um obsession so like he the one that's helping you through all of this <laughs> so i have here though is it true that you take 30 to 40 pills a day to survive mm -hmm. hello welcome to my podcast to my one joe suits i am joe suits i'll be giving a mic to anna anna is living with stage four colon cancer and cystic fibrosis also has a dwayne the rock johnson obsession anna called cancer with a k for a reason so let's start with that why do you call cancer with a k when i first got diagnosed back in july of 2021 we give that cancer word a lot of power right so we establish that as like as soon as you hear it you know you're kind of instilled with this fear where it already you kind of already feel powerless so in the first couple days when i was just trying to wrap my head around everything i kind of wanted to take some of its power away and give it back to myself so i started that's how i kind of coped with it to some extent. I, you know, wrote a letter explaining the situation to like, you know, close friends and family and, you know, defined it as cancer with a K. Mm, that's a pretty good way to spin it around to make it feel powerless. I never heard of that, but that's really good way to approach it. Yeah, I, I think it made me feel more comfortable with it. But I, the idea too is that like, you know, once you get diagnosed with anything really, I shouldn't just say cancer, it's really anything. but 
I would say cancer more so because it's more so wide known. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people already know somebody that has it or have had some interaction with it. So they already have this preconceived notion, an idea to some extent of what possibly is going to happen to you or what your situation is going to be. So I was, my thought was like, no, this is going to be my story. It doesn't have to be like anybody else's. It's going to be different. And we're going to, we're going to take some of that power back by just spelling it different. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have the same connotation that the C word has. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty smart. So let's go with what you're diagnosed with. So you have stage four colon cancer about a year and a half now to two years. So let's start with the screening for colon cancer and what caused you to get one at such an early age. So I did not actually get screened or have a colonoscopy until after I was diagnosed with cancer. So then they were just like looking for the cancer when I had the colonoscopy, which is not, you don't want to be getting a colonoscopy because they're looking for the Mm -hmm. cancer. Like they're trying to establish where it's at. My path to diagnosis was kind of strange. I had a dime size mass uh, in my groin back in June of 2021. Okay. And I went to the doctors, got it checked out. Nobody thought it was anything serious, was no big deal, was told to like consult a general surgeon just to double check. Oh, so you're saying um, it was on the outside? So the mass actually obviously started growing and it grew from the size of a dime to the size of a golf ball in less than a month. So by the time I like got an appointment with a general surgeon, it was the size of a golf ball. And I was having some digestive symptoms in that interim Mm -hmm. in the meantime and with cf like the digestive symptoms that someone would have with stage four colon cancer or colon cancer mimic some of the symptoms that digestive symptoms that cf can cause so it was kind of like at first i just thought it was because of cf and like something i ate Mm -hmm. or i didn't take my digestive enzymes or something like that and then as like they kind of persisted and the mass started growing, I became more alarmed. <laughs> I was like, this Yeah, that's scary. Yeah. Right. And I was like there I was convinced, like I was like, they have something to do with each other because they're coinciding around the same time and um so I had done a colon two colon cleanses, like two what you would prep for a colonoscopy. Oh no, that's horrible. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, it was not a good time. I got dehydrated from it, rightfully so, because yeah. my body was not prepared and neither was I. Because they did, like, on an x-ray, they saw the mass, what they, which they thought was, like, a blockage Okay. at the time. So they it prescribed these colon cleanses, thought that would, like, clear everything up. And then it cleared some stuff up, but it didn't stop, you know, some of the issues I was having. And it clearly did not do anything to the mass in my groin. So I reached out to my CF doctors and I asked them if they could expedite the scans that were ordered by the general surgeon so that I could get them sooner because I wasn't feeling well. I was convinced the mass had something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, they did. I went to the ER. I was admitted into the hospital for four days before they decided to biopsy the mass, which I had asked for on day two, just to be clear. So <laughs> the first day there, they did scan. They couldn't figure out what it was. Then they were going to do an MRI and they were kind of waiting and they tried to send me home and I refused to leave. (laughs) So they biopsied the mass and obviously within a week or so it came back stage, like it came back colon cancer, but clearly it was staged at a later stage because it was clearly already outside of my colon since it was like in, you know, my groin area. And that's how I got diagnosed. So by the time I was having the colonoscopy, it was more so like, we're looking for cancer and trying to figure out which part of your colon it's actually in and where it's at. So you're saying that you got like a small tumor kind of thing in your groin area and they thought it was benign or just nothing to worry about. So they kind of like just delete it slowly over time and you kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then they wanted to send you home and you're like, no, still like they did the biopsy and the biopsy proved that you do have something and then you have cancer. So when you say you have stage four, does that mean it is based on the size of your colon or like where I mean, the size of the tumor and where it is or like how, how are the stages like staged, I guess. So for colon cancer, it's once it's stage four, that's like the top, you've reached the top of the cancer elevator. Mm-hmm. There's no more floors left. It means it has spread outside its primary area 
and to other organs. So, right, like, and obviously it spread to my reproductive organs. The mass was actually my ovary, which slipped through a hernia, but had a cancer mass on it. So it was like a whole complex thing. You know, it had spread to my liver. There was over 15 lesions, like oh 15 God. tumors on my liver when I, yeah, once they ended up doing a PET scan and I had all the tests done. It was on both of my ovaries. It was in my like stomach lining. Well, um, shit. So yeah, lymph nodes obviously as well. Stage three is basically when it is still in your, obviously also in my colon, right? So it's in your colon, but usually only spreads to like close lymph nodes is what the stage three is. And then it's stage four anytime it spreads further than that. So, so when you did the MRI and CAT scan and then they saw that you have, no further, you had the biopsy, they said that you have the cancer, so you did the MRI and you saw that everywhere it was everywhere. So was there a point to do a colonoscopy since you were able to do that? Or is there like a more, I guess, rigorous process to it for finding? Well, yeah. So what they can, I had a PET scan. And basically what a PET scan is, is it basically scans your whole entire body. They give you like this sugar stuff and the cancer lights up like a Christmas tree on the images. So that's how I figured out how many spots it was in my body. But the idea of the colonoscopy was to A, fi figure out what part of the colon the tumor was in and get a biopsy of, okay. the, of the tumor to get like the tumor DNA and test it to see like what kind of therapies it would or would not respond to. So the, you know, the colonoscopy ended up being part of the deal at that point to get a biopsy of the actual like primary tumor. So they had a biopsy of the, you know, area that was not in the colon, but they wanted to get a biopsy of the primary tumor as well. So if the doctors were more proactive with your diagnosis, would that mean that you would have a lesser stage of colon cancer or possibly none if they were able to find it fast and remove it? Yeah, so had I had gotten screened or colonoscopy maybe five years ago, maybe four years ago, colon cancer is very slow growing. So it can take like 10 years oh. for some people to go from sta the beginning stages to a stage four diagnosis. Obviously, I'm only 30 six right now so i was 34 when i got diagnosed nobody was recommending that a 24 year old or a 25 year old should get a colonoscopy yeah. for right now it's actually 45 for the general population and cf patients are five to ten times more likely to develop colon cancer because of our uh, genetic defect caused by cystic fibrosis but we're still not even screened or recommended that we get screened until age 40. so again 34 not 40. So yeah, I, I try not to play that game like in my head because it's, it's torturous. What if I would have like, that's not, that's not what happened. That's not how it worked out. But in theory, had I had gotten screened or a colonoscopy earlier, they could have, you know, if it was in its beginning stages of a polyp, they can just remove polyps and mm -hmm. it's done and over with, like no big deal. Or even a stage two where they can like, you know, mostly remove it with surgery and you know you kind of go about your business so you know unfortunately that wasn't what happened for me but that's like why i'm an advocate for lowering the screening age because they are finding colon cancer in younger and younger people it's actually like a borderline epidemic as reported by numerous reputable news outlets they are finding it and they're going to continue finding it in younger and younger people like millennials and gen x are are more likely to develop colon cancer than their parents generation and when they're finding it in younger people they're finding it at this later stage because we're not testing mm -hmm. people that young and it's colon cancer is considered a silent killer that's its nickname because mm -hmm. you can clearly live for a very long time with it inside your body and have no idea. So I didn't really have any signs or symptoms to some extent until it was stage four. I mean, you're make, you're getting me scared so, for that. I have colon cancer now too, and I'm just, I'm here busy with you doing a podcast or I should be in a hospital. Yeah, so, you know, I think that that's like, it's kind of, there's, we have to save ourselves to some extent. Like we have to be our own advocate. Like if we think something's off or feels not right, like follow that instinct and don't take no for an answer, you know, 
because you could end up saving your own life. I mean, you must be a really rare case to have cancer at such an early age that they didn't even like think that you could have stage four or even stage three at the time you got what as you started researching into it. Yeah, so I didn't even start like I started asking questions about colonoscopies like a couple months before I got diagnosed. Unfortunately, it's it's not that rare anymore. Like they're finding it in more people with CF as well that are under 40 and it's again like getting later stage diagnosis. And by 2030, I believe colon cancer is going to be the second like highest diagnosed and what's the best word for it I, without being too dark. Well, you know what? It's going to kill the most people under the age of 50 by 2030. Oh. That's the trajectory it's on right now. Um, that is a scary fact. So, yeah. Um, so, you know, and if the age is 45, you know, in my opinion, it needs to be lower because we can change that, right? Like that's a, that's the trajectory it's on right now, but it doesn't have to stay that way. If people get screened earlier and doctors kind of change their mindset around somebody not being like it being an older onset disease, then we can kind of change those statistics and it doesn't have to be that way. Like it, it doesn't, if you catch it early enough, it's one of the most pre preventable and treatable if caught early enough. Yeah. You know, once you catch it where your whole body is basically, you know, it's traveled all the places it would go, like that Dr. Seuss book, then it becomes a fight. A, a fight. It, you're literally fighting for your life. Like I'm never going to, to some extent, get off of chemotherapy. I still do chemotherapy every two weeks. It's now like another disease I have to manage. Like it becomes a chronic disease. Yeah, so let's talk about that. So you have to do chemo every two weeks. So I'm guessing you started since the day you were diagnosed with stage four colon cancer? So I started chemotherapy in September of 2021. Okay. First I tried immunotherapy, uh, that did not work. And so I, I was quickly transitioned to chemotherapy. So I've been doing chemotherapy since September of 2021. Well, I mean, I don't, I yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not like fam so familiar, but like, how do you know if something doesn't work? I know like chemo takes kind of a while for it to like start working. I'm like, let's say you want to shrink the tumor, it takes a while. Like how do you know if something doesn't work? So I did two rounds of immunotherapy and my symptoms were getting worse. And so they did a scan and they found that the cancer had, in that time, even that short six week time frame. Had oh spread. my God. So <laughs> that's, that's a yeah. tell sign it's like not working. <laughs> <laughs> the tumors got bigger. There was new ones. So, you know, it was a quick transition to chemotherapy after that scan. So how is chemotherapy treating you? I don't, in, um, I don't enjoy it, but it's kind of, I've kind of like made this relationship with it where it's unnecessary evil, right? Like it's keeping me alive. The odds of me being here to have this conversation with you when I first got diagnosed probably were not very good, to mm -hmm. be honest. So, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful to even be here yeah. uh so it's a necessary evil i actually have chemotherapy tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> so i'm not looking forward okay. to it i still get anxious before going because i know i'm not going to feel good for four to five days i take it to go i call it chemo to go but there's no fries no shake no happy meal toy you take home a pump you wear it for three days essentially so i get it thursday i wear it thursday friday and they come take it away on saturday okay. and then you know, I, I don't feel good Sunday. <laughs> That's just really kind of how that works. By Monday, I start to kind of feel a little better, stuff like that. But, you know, I think I, you know, this, I'm lucky, right? Like I actually am very lucky that I'm kind of on this maintenance program where I don't have to get hit with the same super heavy drugs that I got hit with in the very beginning. And it's been effective for me. Unfortunately, that's not the story for everybody. Everybody's different and everybody responds different and everybody's DNA mm -hmm. is different. So, you know, I'm grateful to some extent that I, I only like this little, you know, to chemo to go pump is really the only chemotherapy drug I'm currently on. I'm on two and that is it. I was on at 1.4, like 
this time last year. And that was hard because then there was all those side effects from all, all of the chemotherapies, right? So, you know, that's yeah, I mean, yeah. kind of how that... Yeah. Like, I don't know if it's really ignorance, but when I think of chemo, I always think of, like, you go to the hospital and they have, like, a comfy chair, and then you're just sitting there for, like, six to eight hours. So why is yours different where you're allowed to go home and you can have it over three days instead of one sitting? So I used to go for one sitting and still take the pump home for three days. So, yeah, you like, in the beginning, I would go for, like, six to eight hours. The take-home pump is just, that's just the way the drug is. It's given very slowly mm -hmm. over three days. So that's, you get to take it home be, because otherwise you'd be in the hospital. Yeah, and that sucks. Getting it, right? It's very slow drip. So science and medicine have clearly come a long way where we can do I, some IV therapeutics at home. So there is that plus to it. But in the beginning I was, I was sitting in the chair for like six to eight hours and still taking the pump home. And I would feel like I got hit by a bus. Mm -hmm. So I'll, so I'll <laughs> um, see you at the club tomorrow night after your IV thing? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I mean, that's... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll bring <laughs> my poison and then you guys can buy your poison. There you the go. So perfect, perfect, perfect. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're going to have the same side effects in the morning. You know, nausea, vomiting, all that. Right. So it works out really well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to want to eat. It's all going to be fine. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, it's just crazy that you're able to bring it home, and since you're consistent doing it every two weeks, that your body kind of, like, I guess, anticipate, like, do you, do you recover, I guess, better from it because you're more used to it, or is it still, like, the same shitty experience every single time? It is kind of like you run the course of everything. Yeah, I think it's just kind of the same experience every single time. But the longer you're on it, it's cumulative. So actually, the longer you're on it, the more side effects you're going to oh, get. Wow. So I've actually been feeling, yeah, I've been feeling worse the longer I've, I've been on it. So that has not been uh, enjoyable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the recovery period I, is similar to some extent or has been the whole time. You know, it does make you more tired. Like, so I'm more tired now than I was mm -hmm. before. So I might be more tired on a Monday and Tuesday than I was previously, but honestly, I don't even remember. Like, <laughs> so I can't really say for sure. But you know, I think when I was on all of the drugs like this time last year, that was really hard. I did lose all of my hair. This is it growing back. Um, I mean, in a year, that's pretty so, fast to grow your hair. Yeah, it's been. It was. I had surgery in December of 2021. I lost all my hair in, or most of my hair in October of 2021. I shaved the rest off because it actually hurts when it falls out. Huh, really? Besides being super depressing and upsetting, it hurts. Yeah, it doesn't feel good. So it was easier to at some point just like kind of shave it off because at least it didn't really hurt. While it was probably one of the harder things mm -hmm. uh, that I had to go through. You know, so it started growing back actually because I had a break to have surgery. So that's kind of when it started like rapidly growing, growing, growing back in to some extent because I didn't, wasn't on any chemotherapy for like eight weeks while I had surgery the first couple weeks before surgery and then a couple weeks after surgery just to kind of recover. And it hasn't, knock on wood or whatever, <laughs> it hasn't fallen out again. Yeah, so, I was just going to ask, how do you have hair now? It is, I guess you're like consistent with your came out that you don't need you don't lose as much hair i guess uh i i don't know and i don't really think they know either like with mo most times when you're treating for colon cancer you don't lose all of your hair it just thins but I, that wasn't my experience <laughs> so you know i was just grateful when it started growing back it like stuck around like because i wasn't sure at first what was going to happen because no one really knew why it really fell out to begin with okay. um you know, so I think, you know, I, even the doctor was like, oh, this is abnormal. This usually doesn't happen. <laughs> I was like, of course not. <laughs> okay. Of course not. Uh, huh? So I think we have an idea of like what a can cancer patient should look like too. And they should all, you know, to some extent, they're all wearing little beanies. <laughs> uh, they've all lost all of their yeah. hair and they're all super skinny. But that is clearly just an idea that, you know, folks have in their head to some extent from experience with certain 
like every cancer is different. Every cancer has a different treatment. Every cancer, every person is different. So that's not, that's not a, there's no real box that all of us mm -hmm. fit into. Yeah. So. I mean, you also could wear a wig too, unless you wildly change your hairstyle. I think, especially as a guy, if you're wearing a wig, we wouldn't even know you're wearing a wig, you know? Or you could get away. Yeah, so I did get some wigs. In the beginning, I had some wigs that I would wear. But I also didn't, it was like, I didn't really go a lot of yeah. places. So I was just mostly home wearing a hat because it was cold. It was, you know, winter time when my of hair kind of started falling out. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm like, of course you fall out <laughs> when it's cold. It's starting to get winter now. And you're going to grow back in the summer. Okay. Which was fine. But, you know, so I, I did, or I do, I still have them. I do still have like three or four wigs that I went out and got. Yeah, I mean, a relatable experience that I used to actually have really long hair, like 10 inch, and I donated it to charity, and I also got it cut during the winter time, and I didn't realize how warm hair was until I, like, stepped outside, and I was like, <laughs> holy shit, it's really cold outside. Yeah, I also did not know <laughs> until really. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, this actually, okay. Yeah, it's weird. Um, like, you kind of want to, you yeah. kind of want to, like, grab it and, like, glue it back on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I'm like hmm. So I do have and did have a lot of hats, like yeah. you know, different color knit hats that I was wearing for a while. And then I I donated actually a bunch of them to the cancer center. Yeah, I mean I have here center. that you have I believe it's called NED. Um I forgot Damn it, what's the acronym for? Yeah, no evidence there you of go. disease. So uh, which is a miracle for those who believe in miracles. You know, as of February, uh, I still have no evidence of disease. So that means that basically they can't see anything on the scans. So a lot of my cancer was cut out by surgery. I had both my ovaries removed, colon resected, and they removed some of the, the, the lymph nodes, some of the tumors in the stomach lining. But there was still my liver who had that had like six lesions on it right before I had surgery. So there wasn't anything they could surgically do for my liver. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, to some extent, by the time surgery wrapped up and going through chemotherapy, they thankfully slowly like disappeared. And Congratulations! In February of twenty. Thank you. I still have no evidence of disease, and I'm I'm getting a scan in May, like the next couple weeks. So. You know, fingers crossed, but that's still the case. Yeah. How often um, do you get scanned? But every three months. Okay. So you're really up to date with so, what your body's doing. Yeah, so it was every two months in the beginning. And then, you know, it became every three as, you know, the, the things were, I was still responding to chemotherapy and things were shrinking. They switched it out to every three months, which is an adjustment for my brain to get used to was like, wait a second, <laughs> we have to know what's going on every yeah. two months. And now, no, three months. And I was like, no, no, I still want to know every <laughs> two months. What do you mean? So I think scans are probably like an easy test because you just lay yeah. there. But mentally, like probably hard, hard. Yeah. I mean, you um, have no idea what's happening. Yeah. yeah. And I think when you get diagnosed with something like that, for most folks, you didn't know you had me like it lived inside me for years silently mm -hmm. and I had no idea so how would I have any idea if it's doing something that I don't like now I, I, I really I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know or at least that's, that's the idea it's like I didn't know then how would I know now if it was you know coming back or, or whatever like knock on wood hopefully it's not doing any of those things but you know so I think waiting for the scan results is like super anxiety provoking for sure like they actually call it skin scan anxiety mm. like they take yeah. scan and add anxiety and combine them together because it is it's it's something that i you know i grew up with cystic fibrosis my whole life which is as of right now there's still no cure for that disease either but you know skin like getting scans and it, it's a whole different experience than living with cystic fibrosis. Yeah, I, I don't know if you mentioned the podcast or I did found the research, but I think you mentioned that 
you will always have to have chemo, I guess, for the rest of your life. Like, why? I mean, I get why you would have it so you would keep the tumors away. I love that you have an analogy that you wish you find turkeys and not tumors, which is really funny. Um, so like, yeah. what, will there ever be a window where you don't have to take chemo anymore and like test the water out? So, I'm actually trying to do that this summer, okay. if possible. I just like my body needs a break. Yeah, my my body needs a break. But I mean, the idea is that because there is no cure. And there's no real test to be totally 100% mm -hmm. sure that you don't have cancer cells floating around in your blood. And there is actually a blood test now that will f test for that. But they, they're still trying to figure out the best way to use it for stage four cancer. So I did have the test done, I'm getting some extra scans to try and figure out if I could take like a little, you know, chemo vacation, we'll yeah. call it. But the idea is that, like, because it's stage four and the chemo is working, you want to keep doing mm -hmm. the chemo because it's working, keeping the cancer base. So the idea is, like, if you take your foot off the the gas pedal, does something, you know, there's always a risk. Yeah, so let's talk you know? about your personal opinion. So if the doctor allows you to get off of it, would you get off of it for the summer, let's say? I go back and forth. So, like, I was pretty convinced you know, about beginning of March that like I needed this summer break if I can get mm -hmm. it. And obviously it's, you know, the decision is really made by how the test comes back, whether, mm -hmm. you know, the scans and everything else more so than me to some extent. But, you know, I thought about it and I like, I just felt like I need a break. And then I also thought about the other mm -hmm. side of it. Like, okay, maybe I just take a three week break in the summer to go on a trip or something yeah. and then get right back on it. I don't know if I have a definitive answer because I go back and forth. Well, you got to decide but right now think... what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> right now, I've convinced myself to probably stay on it until July at least, regardless of what the test says. So, because I mean, it's already almost May. You know, like this is how I do it. I'm like, it's almost mm -hmm. May. You can keep doing it. It's like, how do you eat an elephant? You take one bite at a time. I mean, I hope you take like, like the fullest advantage of your however long you get off it, like book all your vacations and like all your everything you want to do with your new energy like you're gonna feel like a whole new person yeah and i think that's what i'm curious about right like how would i feel if i was off of it for a month you know or six weeks uh or you know whatever if i could get off of it for longer uh, that would be great. Like, I guess if that blood test comes back and says there's no cancer DNA floating around in my blood, then I'd probably feel very comfortable being like, okay. <laughs> but there's no way to know how fast that number climbs yeah. once you go up off chemotherapy. So I think that's, you know, that's the difficult part. And it's like, you know, if you only, we only have one life and we literally have zero idea how long we will be here. I was supposed to not be here now aside from cancer. Like my life expectancy was 17 when I was born in 1987 from cystic fibrosis. So, you know, I, to that extent, I've lived almost 20 years longer than originally expected. <laughs> so I think to some extent you have to, you have to make that decision for yourself and your life. And if, what do you want? What do you want to experience? What do you want to do? And how do you, you know, <laughs> get the most out of what whatever time we're, yeah, we're I mean I know you're right? doing a pep talk but like we got to like talk about you like I'm wondering what you're doing because just listening to your old you're like right in the middle of saying yes or no to do it because you want to I guess it's kind of like the question of do you want to live a longer life but being more in pain or do you want to like maybe live a shorter life but have more non-pain moments I think I want to live a longer life. Okay. That's what I want. I want to live a longer life. I have some things I want to mm -hmm. do in the next year or so or attempt to do. And um, I think, you know, to some extent, the chemo becomes a necessary evil yeah. to, to accomplish those goals. Like WrestleMania is coming to Philadelphia. Oh, this shit. Time. You're a wrestling fan? Right. Oh, yeah, so, I'm a like, huge wrestling I fan. To, like, okay. 
I want to go to WrestleMania. Oh my so god! So I gotta figure out Both how I can one day. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to go when it comes to Philly, because I live close to Philly. But so there's, it's a two-day event, so you have to, I mean, you could do two days. Oh, I would do all of the days, like go big or go home. Oh my we're gonna God. Do, if we're going to go, we're going to do all the days. Remember the one <laughs> WrestleMania was like nine hours long straight? It was crazy. Yeah, I just, yeah, they just had it on for two days, obviously, the beginning of April, because that's usually when it is. Yeah, one. Um, so I'm actually kind of surprised they're doing it in Philly because the weather here is very unpredictable. Well, it's in the stadium, so I, they have to do it anywhere where there's a stadium. But they used to have WrestleMania, so you know how it's two days now? They used to have it in one full day. So imagine two days yeah. of WrestleMania in one day, like nine hours of straight. I, that's exhausting for any person. Like, my God. Like, yeah. you could, like I was just thinking, like, if you pregame before the stadium... You will be sober by the end of it. Like, that's crazy. For sure. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah so. that's exciting. To, yeah, you should definitely go pay the money. Do it's a spectacle of it. Did you like last, did you like this year at Master Uh, I honestly, I had chemo that weekend and I put it on and I was like, I'll go watch it in my bedroom and lay down. And I lasted like 15 minutes, oh. so I didn't see a lot of wrestling. No, you gotta watch it. It was <laughs> really good. It very, um, ca I mean, to me, it's very captivating to, like, watch the whole thing. Like, I love the whole spot to go and, like, it's, like, one of the few things that I can, like, watch without, like, without, like, using your phone. Like, I'm, I'm like, engulfed in it and, like, oh, my God. I guess my heart rate going. I just love the whole spot to go of it. And wrestling is always a spot Yeah, I remember last, last year, I watched the whole thing. Or both days, or... But know, I was, um... I think it was two days later. I, that was, uh, I don't think they had an audience last... Did they have an audience last year? In 22, they did. Okay. Yeah, because I remember one year they didn't have an audience, and that was the strangest experience on the planet. With no crowd, yeah, nothing. Yeah, where it was just, like, these screens. Yeah. Yes. So, Stone Cold came back and wrestled Kevin Yeah, Owens that was crazy. I couldn't... Im I didn't... So. All the bumps he was doing, I'm like, oh my god, he's like 65, and I'm like, holy shit, they're gonna really do it. Yeah, I was thinking maybe he would come back this year, but he, yeah, that's okay. He, um, he might come back next year, but uh, Vince been banned. Vince, not Vince, um, yeah, Vince came back too and rest. wait, was it Vince? Yeah, he mm -hmm. came back and wrestled mm -hmm. too with Pat McAfee, and I was like, holy shit, yep. like, what a moment for him. Yeah. Like, out of... Like, that part was super cool. Especially if somebody, like, you grew up watching it. Like, I that mean, feud is, like, Pat astounding. McAfee is, like, the luckiest guy in the world. Like, not, he's not a wrestler at all or anything. And he, like, was in the ring with Vince and Steve Austin. Like, you can't top that at, at all. And have a beer, too. Yeah, and I think he actually wrestled, yeah, somebody this year. He was there this yeah, year, he, too. Um, he came back with... He wrestled, um... Damn, what did he... It was a short segment, so... Wait... Mm -hmm. I don't remember... I, I know he came back, but I forgot... I love his relationship with uh, Michael Cole, though. Like, it's such a heartwarming relationship. Because he's just so, yeah. like, love. But I've never the... Um, I'm gonna cut all of this out. I'm just excited to talk about this. And then when Chamber Man came back, and then he... He, um, tore mm -hmm. his quad. Which is hilarious. Like, immediately. Yeah, it was hilarious just watching <laughs> it, like, unfold and, like, n not, like, y you knew there was something wrong, like, he was, like, saying, like, I fucked up. Like, it was just hilarious that he did, like, yeah. one jump and he was already out. Which, right the end then. Well, the whole thing with Snoop Dogg was done on the fly, actually. I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. Like, he, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't think he would plan to, like, be in a match at all or anything, but, like. Mm -hmm. It was just crazy to watch. I don't know. WrestleMania is unpredictable. I, I love it. Like, but. Yeah, I think it's fun. And that's, like, one of my goals is, like, I actually told my doctor that, like, not long after I got diagnosed, when I found out WrestleMania was coming to Philly, I was like, hey, buddy, we got to do our best <laughs> to keep me alive at least until WrestleMania of 2024. He was like, what? I was like, yeah. Oh, you 20. Uh, yeah. 2024. You only have, like, nine months left. You can definitely do it. You can pull through yeah, we got it. Yeah, I mean, I hope yeah. you start saving for like a thousand dollars for all those tickets, but there you go. But 
Yeah, I did. I did like tell my mom <laughs> and my stepdad. I was like, yeah. So I want to go to WrestleMania. So like, don't buy me any Christmas presents between now and WrestleMania, and just like help me pay for. Oh yeah, I mean, that's a, <laughs> I mean, I would pay a lot of money for it. Pick it the one once in a lifetime experience to do. Right. Okay. Um, we're gonna go back yeah. to talking about this if I bro this. I know it's a little depressing right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> so let's just add like the, we kept talking about colon cancer for a while, but like you were battling cystic fibrosis basically your entire life. So mm-hmm. having that with chemo and say for colon cancer, it's a hell of a lot to deal with. Like how are you doing it, handling everything? Um, not easily, <laughs> but you know, there's been some really amazing medical breakthroughs with cystic fibrosis the last couple of years and they approved a medication in 2019 that drastically improved my quality of okay. life. I literally do not think that I would have made it here going through chemotherapy had that drug not been approved prior to my starting. Cause that really, that, that, I was like the healthiest I had ever, I had been in like 10 or 15 years in 2020, which like when you think about it, I had cancer and had no idea. <laughs> uh, but my lung function was really good. I had gained some weight. I was feeling good. I could breathe like I didn't even remember what it felt like to breathe Mm -hmm. Uh, so I was like oh yeah we're breathing but then when I started the medication I was like oh this is actually breathing this is very (laughs) different okay so I think you know without that medication I don't I don't know how I would have done or could have done this I actually have to go to the do like pulmonary function test tomorrow before I go get chemotherapy (laughs) so We'll see how my lungs are, like, holding up through this whole process. I mean, were there ever but, any, like, chance that you could not get the chemo? Because chemo is, like, hell to the body. And cystic fibrosis is a very depleting disease of, like, functionality. So, like, were there ever a question like you couldn't do chemo to because your body couldn't handle it? No. Because of that medication. Like, my lung function was, like, 60% or between 50 and 60% before I started that medication and it went up to like 80. So it took like a big jump in the right direction because of the medicine. And I'm still doing breathing treatments. I don't want to get it twisted. Like I'm not doing breathing yeah. treatments anymore or anything like that. But it's a um, lifelong, you know, it it's a lifelong me, battle with it. Yep. Yeah. So it gave me like a really good boost, which put me in a, a good position <laughs> to be able to handle chemotherapy. I mean, the, the like, timing of it is, is perfect yeah. though for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I think you like if I don't know how much my body would have been able to handle like lung function wise. Like I can feel like my lungs have taken a hit. So I expect my PFTs to not be as good as they were like, you know, a couple months ago. But, but that I think is, is also conducive with the environment. Like it was winter here. We're not, you know, you're not doing mm-hmm. as much like all of those things. So I think in the summertime when you're getting out more in the springtime and stuff like that, you know, that all helps with your breathing because you're, you're up and about more. So I don't know when it takes a hit, if it's something I will be able to recover from or it won't be. And there hasn't been a lot of CF patients that have lived long enough to, probably get continuous or have an experience of continuous chemotherapy in general and there's definitely not a lot of us that have clearly had a deal with continuous chemotherapy and this new medication so there's really no science i am like the medical i'm you know the medical journal in you know my experience right so all of this is all brand new unfortunately however you want to look at it or fortunately you know so that remains to be seen how long my body can handle it it's a fine line especially with your liver because your liver takes a beating from your cf meds uh your whole life so i already had some liver issues prior to all this starting so that's like the fine line we have to walk is like also paying attention to like the liver and is it handling the chemo well and like is it processing your cf meds like all those things so it's not your typical cancer case, and it's clearly no longer your typical CF case anymore either. So it sounds so. like you were on a mat, and then you kicked out with two and seven eights. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And hopefully I keep kicking out. Uh. Or, you know, 
it's like I'm on maintenance chemo is what they call it. So I always joke that like I'm like a car now. I just get maintenance every two weeks. And I just hope that the annoying people still call and renew my lifetime warranty. Yeah, you're like the Roman <laughs> reign lady that never, no one can ever beat you. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, let's, since we're all on the wrestling topic, let's talk about your Dwayne The Rock Johnson um, obsession. So, like, is he the one that's helping you through all of this? For For <laughs> sure. On the subject of Roman Reigns, my dog's actually named after Roman Reigns. His really? Name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so he's my favorite. Roman Reigns is my favorite current WWE superstar. Okay. I mean, uh, Dwayne had, the Rock Johnson. He had Johnson that aura to him. Like he's, I mean, he's, right. I don't know, he did, he, he did it. I know he, like, the boat, like you're about to hate him, but like, some, something about him, you're already attracted to him. Yeah, yeah. I, as soon as I saw him, I thought he was cool. And then, you know, he's... He, uh, ironically, or at whatever, but, like, he, you know, he actually stepped away from wrestling because he was diagnosed with cancer yeah. and i got my dog after he came back like 29 the beginning well, of 2019 can we both and, can we both agree that before like when he was like on a show you kind of like lame though and like now he's really awesome like there's like a period where he was just kind of lame and it was like weird he wasn't good at anything you know oh man okay yeah i just like <laughs> I, I don't know. I just thought he was like lame. Huh? He wouldn't. Uh, they were trying to make him like the top guy, but I don't think he was like. Or he was ready for it. Like I do. Like there was nah. a promo between John Cena and and Roman, and Roman just like did horrible against John. You know, like he wasn't ready for the spotlight. But like now, he's on a totally yeah, different level. Yeah, I think he's kind of like forced. Roman is on a totally like different level now. Yeah. No, he's really like I. I was always attracted to him <laughs> you like your Samoans so my opinion yeah my, my opinion <laughs> clearly you gotta type um, I was a fan from the beginning I was like he can be quiet and just stand <laughs> there that's fine what, what are we complaining for so you acknowledge um, him but yeah exactly always <laughs> always I actually met him at like a comic con that okay. came to Philly I forget what year but I met him and Randy Orton and Dolph Ziggler I guess it was maybe 2018-ish. Okay. Comic-Con came to Philly, and they were part of the folks that came through. He's very, He was very nice, like, in real life. I couldn't say anything. I was, like, yeah. too strong. I mean, he's, he, he seemed you know, to be very strong, respected but... and actually a really good person. And he's, like, the total opposite yeah. of his on-screen on persona, which is... Yeah. Great, huh? Yeah. So, you know, it was kind of ironic that... You know, I named my dog after him, and then I found myself going through my own cancer journey, yeah. and I was like, oh, what are what are the odds? But yeah, I've always been a super huge fan of Dwayne Johnson ever since I was young. <laughs> so he's my favorite person, and I think he's the best person. <laughs> and he actually made me a video when I first got diagnosed that he posted on his Instagram. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in August of 2021. One. It, or, it, yeah. it on your Instagram? I didn't see that. It is to some extent. Yeah, I almost said to death now. <laughs> yeah, so he posted on his own Instagram and had like 3 million views. Oh, okay, um, I see. I, a friend. Right, I see the video. Yeah. To a very special woman, a very strong woman. Her name is Anna Payne. A Middletown, Pennsylvania. Middletown, stand up. Got Anna Payne representing with the strength. Right, this message goes out. Oh, uh, okay, cut out. A very special woman. Yeah, it like I didn't couldn't figure out how to share the whole thing, but it is on his Instagram. I have it like saved to my. Yeah. Oh my. Holy shit! Uh, how did that even come to be? A friend of mine uh, wrote him a letter uh -huh. and explained my situation and what I was going through. Because anytime someone asked me what I wanted or what I needed, and I was in the beginning of it, I was just like, no, I just need Dwayne Johnson to make me a video <laughs> and tell me everything's going to be okay, and everything will be okay. And I think I've earned that at this point. So, you know, I, that's kind of how it came to be. Like, a bunch of people were at that point like, okay, she literally doesn't talk about anything else. That's all she wants. Like, let's see if we can figure out how to make it work. And he did. Oh, my God. You must have, and, like... Uh, freaked out like my god yeah i it was it's still one of the best things that's ever <laughs> happened to me if not the best thing 
So, yeah. And I've, I've played the video, you know, especially in the beginning when everything was like super rough and hard and it was just like in the very beginning it was just one curveball after another uh especially because things didn't work right like you know and you found out like it spread and i had to take a helicopter from one hospital to another for an emergency procedure and it was just like you know one thing after another kind of trying to you know juggle all these things going on and you know there's no science <laughs> or data behind has Dwayne The Rock Johnson's video anything to do with the reason I'm no evidence of disease? I don't, um, I believe so. I believe so. Because it gave me something good at a time where I felt very isolated. So would, would you say all the brain was worth it to have a video of Dwayne talking to you? <laughs> hmm. I also, I actually often joke, it's like in The Little Mermaid when Ariel signs the uh, agreement from Ursula to give away her voice to get mm -hmm. feet. I feel like that's must have been what I did before I got here. They were like, we will give you that Dwayne Johnson video, but I did not read the fine print <laughs> of the contract of how it, uh, so, you know, I, I wouldn't trade that for anything really. You know, I know things has been like super hard and I don't want anyone else to have to go through it. And that's why I advocate for earlier screening and stuff like that. But do I think it was part it's part of what I what I had to go through to some extent. I, I mean, do. you you I might get lucky and he might appear at WrestleMania the next WrestleMania. I'm hoping. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> that's what I'm I mean, for. No, almost nothing is really stopping you from entering the ring, and like, you'll get tackled <laughs> after that. But like, I think for the two seconds of touching him will will like make you live forever. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, that video was like, I don't know, a couple minutes long, but just the idea yeah. that, like, yeah. he, he did yeah, that. Yeah, for, uh, for him, such a bit, bit, for such a busy person, for the sake of the time to make a video for you, is like really amazing to, to you and all the other Annas, you know? <laughs> right, right. Yes. All of us Annas. Yeah. But yeah, like that, yeah. you know, kind of. I rode that high for a really long time, and I still, to oh, some yeah. extent, I know I do. I would introduce it every conversation uh, I have with anybody. Like, no one can top that. Yeah, so, right, and like every time, like I, I don't play the video for myself that much because I want it to be special every time mm -hmm. I watch it, and I want, you know, or every time I hear it, however you want to phrase it. But so I do get like a little emotional every oh, time yeah. I hear it because I'm like, oh. Yeah. I mean, so I, so I have here though. It is true that you take thirty to forty pill the day to survive mm -hmm. yeah like how how is that like possible though like how do you divide it up for the, for the day so i take digestive enzymes every time i eat so that's how it kind of adds up it depends on what you're eating how many you take with some meals it could be three it some meals it could be eight just to digest my food on top of you know anything else i need to take like that new medication and you know vitamins and antibiotics and stuff so it adds up pretty quick uh, 30 to 40 isn't really that many when you're talking about if you're you know just say you're eating three meals a day and you're taking at least six that's already 20 pills almost right there i mean this is <laughs> it's a lot I'm, i mean i know it's your normal but this is a lot i mean that, that's yeah, a lot of maintenance yeah it is my normal it is, yeah. And you do breathing treatments and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, like, holy shit. So you need a break. Yeah, it's you a lot. You need that summer break really badly. I do. I thought I was going to get one, and then I got cancer. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to get a break. I'm going to get to live my best life. And then the universe was like, hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, I got to get the rock to make another video for you. Like, take a break. Like, chill out a little bit. Enjoy that summer. <laughs> yeah, hey, man. <laughs> Go on a trip. <laughs> yeah, so let's just list your accomplishments that I have here. So I don't know how well you do with com uh, with compliments, but here we go. So in 2015, Anna received a Patient Volunteer of the Year Award from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Delaware Valley Chapter. To date, she has raised more than $60,000 for the foundation to advance research and patient support program, which is really awesome. Like, you're not only just advocating on Instagram, but you're actually, like, helping researchers move forward so like you don't have to suffer as much 
Kind of despite her health challenges and a full-time job, Anna volunteers her time to all the above boards and organizations to help make a difference and improve the lives of others. She is the supervisor of Middletown Township, Bucks County, and was an elected delegate to the 2016 Democratic National Bench Convention, which is really dope. Like you're really, really wanting to change the landscape of cystic fibrosis and make it better for the next generation. Yeah, that's kind of my goal. I started my own nonprofit myself and some other families in Bucks back in 2020, but then there was like this pandemic or something that happened. So we didn't really get started until 2021, and we, in our first year, we raised the $80,000, and we gave out grants to different uh, nonprofits, most of the money. So, you know, I think in, like, leaving something better than I found it is, like, my goal. You know, whether that's the CF space or the rare disease space, or even now in the cancer space, you know, that in my own community by being township supervisor. So, you know, the idea is that I want to you know, we, we're only here for a small amount of time, right? Even if you think about it, like if somebody lives to 80, that's still not a really long time. When uh, I think it's it. enough when you're at the age of 80 and you're like, I'm tired of this. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I want to live that long. But like, when you think about it, it goes by mm-hmm. fast. And I, you know, I never planned on living a long life because that was not in the cards for me. So to me, it was just always like, what can I do now? And a lot of that kind of mentality strips away a lot of your fear to doing something new and different that you maybe don't have a lot of experience in. Um, So I've been grateful for that. So, Like, you know. Yeah, so before I take the mic away from you, is there anything you want to say from her? Any words of wisdom, the winning lottery numbers? The mic is all yours. If you know the winning lottery numbers, you should I'm not that on your I definitely do not. Uh (laughs) I'm going to buy whole Um, WrestleMania and just me be in the audience That's a (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's what I would use the money for. So save money for a wrestling. No, you would see. The, you would. Um, you would buy. No, you would buy the house next to Dwayne the Rock Johnson, so you can have him as your neighbor and you can say hi every day. And... That, that. Yeah, that's actually a yeah, fair thought. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> yeah, you're more like. I'll be your. Um, yeah. um, I'll be your bank, <laughs> and I'll just let. I'll okay, be your you advisor. Go. Yeah, you can be my financial advisor. <laughs> yeah. I'm like short side. I'm like, yeah, what can I do right now? <laughs> <laughs> buy, you know, buy WrestleMania tickets. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I have necessarily anything that I want to end it with. Just that I hope, you know, folks read up about their risks for developing colon cancer um, and get screened. You know, like 45 is, isn't good enough. And follow your gut and your instincts about your health. And don't stop advocating for yourself because you can end up saving your life. All right, so thank you so much, Anna, for giving me your time and expertise. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening and watching. You can follow Anna in the description below, her Instagram and all that. So, um, and I'll see everyone next time. Bye-bye.